So, big question, where were we in our study of James when we last gathered? Well, we're about to enter into the very last chapter of James. So we got to take a look at what ground we've covered. Okay, has anybody not seen this slide over the last two months that we've been using it? No, right? You know that James is the leader of Christianity in A.D. 49. That he talks about trials, temptation, and triumph. That favoritism and discrimination do not work in a Christian worldview. That working really hard to get yourself saved doesn't work. That the tongue, oh my goodness, how much are we hit with this one every week? That the tongue is something that really shows where our heart is and that sometimes that can be quite savage. We know that worldly wisdom doesn't hold a candle to God's wisdom, which comes from the Word. James 4 talks about choosing. Are you in or are you out? Are you going to split your pants trying to be in and out at the same time? And then last week we talked about slandering, judging, and boasting. Well, this week... James chapter 5, verses 1 through 12, are going to take us in a new yet similar direction. Now, that sounds kind of weird, doesn't it? New yet similar. Okay, well, let's, let's get there. Please join me in your Bibles. Again, I hope you have your Bibles. Did you notice that at the back of the, uh, the bulletin, there's an area for sermon notes? So if you'd like to jot some stuff down, study just came out this week. I heard it. I heard it. Study came out that said for remembering uh, important facts and figures in school, typing does not hold the same recall as writing things down. Actually, the remembering comes from recopying and organizing your thoughts spatially. So just jotting some stuff down might be a good idea for you. I'm going to read James 5, verses 1 through 12 in the NIV. Remember, we study out of the NAS, but I read out of the NIV in case you're following. Here we go. Chapter, one, uh, chapter 5, verse 1. Now listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of the misery that's coming on you. Your wealth has rotted, and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields, fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You've lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You've fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You've condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains? You too, be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You've heard of Job's perseverance, and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no. Otherwise, you will be condemned. So the title of this sermon is Rich is Overrated. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, let's study what James has to say and see if you can come to your own conclusion on that topic. Don't let me squeeze something into your head. You figure it out. This paragraph of thought that we just read really is split into two subjects. Verses 1 through 6 are about the people that are oppressing, and then verses 7 through 12 are about enduring the oppression until God settles all accounts. Now, before you say, I hope those people in section one are listening because I'm a section two person. I'm not an oppressor at all. Those people are. I'm the oppressed. You might want to hold on for just a minute. You might be jumping the gun. Let's wait and see 
where you fall on the spectrum. As you know from our study of this letter, James has a way of turning things on their head. He challenges our long-held beliefs and being rather blunt in his delivery, he does so. And he's been doing so as I've been preaching James. So here we go. Let's take a look at verse 1. Come now, you rich, and weep and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you. Come now, in the New American Standard, is the literal Greek translation, but the meaning's kind of lost a bit unless it's contextualized. I believe the NIV says this phrase best. It says, now listen. James is saying, hey, yo, listen up. Hey, psh, do you hear what I'm about to say? Listen up, because this is important for all of you. He says right here in verse 1, Come now, you rich. Hmm, rich. I've wanted to be rich all my life. Anybody else with me? Yeah, I've wanted to be rich. I wanted to be able to do what I wanted to do, when I wanted to do it, have what I wanted. Not the generic or the stripper model, but the deluxe, tricked out model. Anybody else in the room resonate with the pursuit of money, the desire to raise to a higher station in life? the willingness to bust your backside to get it, to go the extra mile to achieve success? Is that the person that James is talking to here? Well, maybe. Ecclesiastes 5.10 says, He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves abundance with its income. This too is vanity. So we know from the Scripture that there's no satisfaction in money. So then, what does James intend when he's talking to this group called the rich? Well, if you study it really closely, what you find out is that he's talking to unbelievers as defined in James 2, verses 6 and 7. So James gives us the Codus Sinaiticus. He gives us the, uh, the, the secret decoder ring to what it is he's saying here because he told us earlier. And just in case you weren't paying attention at the time, or you've forgotten because it's been a few weeks, James 2, verses 6 and 7, but you have dishonored the poor man. Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you have been called? Are they not unbelievers? Do they not persecute you? That's what James says. So here, when he's talking to the rich, he's talking to those people. Whew. Everybody just breathe out. Oh, well, he's not talking to me. Wow, that's good. Did you ever notice that when you're outlining a lesson for your kids, or as you were correcting them, how much the lesson actually applies to you if you paid attention? Ever notice that when you point at somebody, three fingers, fingers point back at you and one towards heaven? Well, maybe we need to pay attention to the lesson also. We might not be as innocent as we think we are. He tells these people in verse 1, hey man, you better weep and howl. James is speaking as a prophet, telling them that they better get on with it now because there's going to be reason to weep and howl. He's telling them right now, whatever it is you're doing, guess what? Bad's coming. Start weeping and howling right now. In verse 2, he says, your riches have rotted and your garments have become moth-eaten. Garments. Clothing was a sign of wealth, and many peasants, blue-collar folks, believe it or not, only had one garment. They only had one thing that they wore. Imagine what that would be like after a week in the fields. Whew. Right? be pretty terrible. He's speaking to the rich here, and he's saying, your riches have rotted. In the Greek, there are three perfect tense verbs in use here. Perfect tense indicates now and continuing action. You see, the misery that was to come has already started. The rotting has already begun. It's not, oh, you know what? You're, uh, you know, you're not doing so well with this whole rich thing, so in the future, uh, things are going to be bad for you. He's saying, no, guess what? They're bad now. These rich people are hoarding their wealth, and James is exposing the fragility of it. It's fragile. 
We can lose what we hoard in a moment, can't we? Anybody ever experienced that? Can I say 2008? 401k, anyone? You can lose it like that. This is a parallel to what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 19 and Luke 12, 33. Sell your possessions and give to charity. Make yourselves money belts which do not wear out. An unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes near nor moth destroys. James is paralleling what his half-brother said. Stop. Stop putting so much into hoarding. Wealth is an interesting topic. Jesus talks about money more than any single topic in the Bible. Theologian Daniel Doriani talks about it this way. Material wealth only temporarily quenches the soul's thirst for meaning and acceptance. Acquiring wealth to cure the problem of meaninglessness is like drinking coffee to cure the problem of exhaustion. It can mask the problem, but not cure it. Vicious circle, isn't it? Meaninglessness, wealth. No satisfaction. So I'll get more wealth, feel more meaninglessness. Have no satisfaction. So I must have to try more, do more, get more, be more. That's pretty convicting, isn't it? Maybe not for you, I'll just speak for myself. That's pretty convicting. But I told you this portion of Scripture was written to unbelievers, so it's irrelevant to us, right? Well, the question is, can we serve the God of money? Can we serve the God of acceptance? The church needs the reminders that the unbelieving world needs. For us, it might be a course correction. For them, a complete 180, repent and live. Go the exact opposite way that you were going. For us, it might be, yeah, you know, I've kind of gotten away from that a little bit. Yeah, boy, maybe I am worried a little too much about my own comfort and what that means for me versus giving. So if we look at verses 2 and 3 together, it says, Your riches have rotted and your garments have become moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver have rusted, and their rust will be a witness against you and will consume your flesh like fire. It's in the last days that you've stored up your treasure. Gold and silver rust? What? Do they? Do they rust? No, right? But James is making a point. If I hoard what is God's anyway, I turn it to waste. I do that. I turn it to waste if I hoard it. I make it rust. These material things, they just go to waste. And they're not the only things that go to waste. Job 13, 28 says this, Man wastes away like a garment eaten by moths. Hello? Who does that? Do, don't I do that to myself? We talked last week about life being like a vapor, a mist. It's transient. It's here and gone in an instant. What kind of wealth can you hoard? The wealth of your talent. The wealth of your craft. The wealth of your labor, your time. The wealth of your life in relationship. And yes, God's money. Why? 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 It says right here, it'll be a witness against you. It'll consume your flesh like fire, unbeliever, and bring regret to you, believer. Why? Because if I'm like you, I know that I'm going to be standing before the Bema seat of Christ. That's the judgment seat. The Bema seat, it's called. What is the Bema seat? The Bema seat was um, in any town that you went into, any city. There's a main street where all the commerce was done, 
Well, there was always like a, a big raised up chair, kind of like a throne that would sit there, and the magistrate would sit in that seat. And if there were any kind of disputes among any of the merchants and buyers, they would come right before him. And he would say, you pay him that much money, you give him that back, you do this. We will sit before the Bema seat of Christ. And what will we see? Our entire lives right before us. If we're believers, will we be condemned for our sin? No, Christ paid the price for that. But you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to look and say, oh, Lord, I regret this. I regret that. I didn't do enough here. I didn't give enough there. I wasn't enough here. There's going to be regret if you're a believer. If you're an unbeliever, oof. Yeah, there's a lot of regret there, isn't there? Because you had every chance. In the last days, it says here at the end of verse 3, here James is rebuking us for living like Christ is never coming back to the Bama seat. He's never coming back to judge us, so let's just live it up. Let's just have a really good time. I asked you a question at the beginning of verse 3 to silver and gold rust, and your answer was no. Interesting thing, the silver and gold that was around at the time James wrote this wasn't nearly as pure as what we associate those materials to be. It would actually tarnish and come back to speak against the person who had held them, who had stored them up. The question is, how much will that come back to speak against you? Believer and non-believer. Let's look at verse 4, just the first part. It says, Behold, the pay of the laborers who mowed your fields and which has been withheld by you cries out against you. It was expressly stated by Moses that withholding wages, even overnight, was an offense in Old Testament law. If the worker cried out to God, they would be avenged. It says so in Deuteronomy 24 and Leviticus 19. In ancient Israel, they didn't live paycheck to paycheck, folks. They lived day to day. You know, to not leave the gleanings of the fields was a violation of the Old Testament law as well. How many farmers in the room? Farmers? A few people who understand something about farming? Yeah, okay, there we go. What's a gleaning? It's the leftovers, right? When you're, you're going through a whole field, there's always a little bit of stuff that kind of spits out of the machine or, or would be on the corners that you wouldn't bother getting because you'd round them off and all that stuff. You're supposed to, by Old Testament law, leave those for the poor people. If you didn't, you were in violation. So here, James is saying, hey, you're committing fraud the rich are getting richer, the poor getting poorer. This shows the selfishness of some people. In verse 3, James said that their hoarded riches and garments would cry out against them. Well, now in verse 4, the fraud in their labor practices is going to cry out too. Remember that Deuteronomy said if the offended cried out, they would be avenged? Let's look at the second half of the verse. And the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of Saboth. Now, it says the Lord Almighty in your translation. The literal term is the Lord of Sabaoth. Now, who's that? It's an untranslated Greek word meaning hosts. This is the name used frequently for God throughout the Old Testament. And it depicts God, refers to him as being commander of an army of angels. Guess what that army of angels is going to do in judgment? They're going to be involved in the judgment of unbelievers. And here... James is calling people's attention to it. All right, now you've gotten fat off the backs of your laborers. What are you going to do with the money? Verses 1 through 4 talk about the, the rich landowners getting fat. Then what are you going to do it, with it? Verse 5, you've lived luxuriously on the earth and led the life of wanton pleasure. You've fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. Okay, put yourself in the day when this is being written. First century, 
When they slaughtered animals, they didn't have refrigeration, did they? So they'd gorge themselves on the meat. It was only available for as long as it could stay fresh. Do you know when poor people got lamb and, and other animals? Only during festivals, and they just get a little bit. The rich could have it whenever they wanted. And isn't it an interesting parallel? Fattening animals for slaughter so the owners could gorge themselves and fatten themselves for their imminent slaughter. Like cows, like sheep. They're placid, they're consumers, they're unaware and unsuspecting of their fate, just marching down the line through the metal gates towards their own demise. Who's the spending of the riches all about that God's talking about here, that James is talking about for God? Well, it's all about them, right? People spending on themselves. Well, frankly, it's all about me. Me, myself, and I, if I'm one of them. And I am. I am one of them. Are you? Are you? Do you serve the God of you? Don't answer. James is going to show you some more of you before you actually answer that question. These folks live a life of want and pleasure. They're living it up to the max of their capacity. They lived lavishly. They consumed with the pursuit of pleasure over obedience or service or sacrifice or surrender. Man, I hate it when James holds up the mirror and I can see myself so well in it. I can hardly stand it. Well, it's not over yet. Here comes the next step in the progression of the rich. Let's read verse 6. You have condemned and put to death the righteous man. He does not resist you. So this rich man, he hoards, he cheats, then he murders. What could be worse murder than the murder of a righteous man? The murder of a righteous man that doesn't resist. Now, you could assume that this is an allusion to Jesus Christ, and you might be right. But considering the word condemn in the text, it actually suggests something in the court of law. The rich won, the poor didn't, or weren't even allowed in the court system. You want to know how bad the rich were here in preying on the poor? It says it in Psalm 10, verses 8 and 9. Let me read it to you. He sits in the lurking places of the villages. In the hiding places, he kills the innocent. His eyes stealthily watch for the unfortunate. He lurks in a hiding place as a lion in his lair. He lurks to catch the afflicted. He catches the afflicted when he draws him into his net. Well, that doesn't paint too good a picture of the rich, does it? You know, Old Testament law was different. Old Testament law, unlike the legal system there, was supposed to protect, and it did. It was written to protect widows, the poor, orphans, slaves, and, and the landless. As a matter of fact, the Old Testament law goes so far in Leviticus 25 that it gives something called the Jubilee Law. Anybody ever heard that? The Jubilee? It's not like on Bourbon Street where they, whoop, not that kind of Jubilee. A little different than that. The Jubilee Law. Every 50 years, it required the returning of family lands, preventing the massive accumulation of land that would impoverish some. Well, every 50 years, got to give it all back. Start up, do over, control, alt, delete, reboot, it's all new again. Continuing in verse 7, oh, that all important word, therefore. This is a transition. It's James saying, hey, based on everything I just said in verses 1 through 6, what are you going to do now? Thank you. Say it louder. Yes, that's right. The next two words, be patient. Be patient. The Greek indicates being patient, by the way, with people, not conditions or circumstances. Right here, James is saying very specifically, be patient with people. It says, therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. 
The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it until it gets the early and late rains. Now, in this paragraph in James, there are actually three words that are used. They're all kind of translated as patient, generally, can mean something similar to patient. But it changes the meaning slightly, and I want to cover, you with the, cover with you what those three versions of patient are. Because you need to exhibit all three versions of patience. The first one is in verse 7, right here that we just read. It says, be passive, let it happen. Right, because you can't do anything about the rains. So be patient, be passive, let it happen. Kind of like be patient when, when you want to have a wound to heal. Right? There's nothing you can do about it. You just got to kind of let it be. The next version is to stand firm. Or more literally, as it says in my translation of verse 8 here, strengthen your hearts. It indicates a, a patience born of steely resolve. We have patience in the face of someone who blusters against us and what we might have said because we understand that we have done the right thing. We're patient in the truth until it's ultimately revealed. And verse 8, if we read it right now, says, You too be patient. Strengthen your hearts for the coming of the Lord is near. James is saying when you're about to collapse, hold on, be firm, be resolute. You can do it. Be patient. You know how I know that you, sitting right there, can do more than you do? Do you know how I know that God knows that you can do more than you think you can do? You know how? Well, we're going to do an exercise right now that's going to let you see that. Everybody, put down what you have in your hands. Make sure your, both hands are free. Is everybody clear what that says on the screen? Do exactly as I say. Is there any ambiguity there? Does anyone not understand? You need clarification. What's ambiguity? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay. Do exactly as I say. Okay? Nothing more. Just what I say. Literally. Okay. When I count three, I want everybody to reach their hands over their heads as high as you possibly can. Ready? One, two, three. Okay, hold them. Keep them. Okay, now everybody reach just a little bit higher. You just made my point. You just made my point. What did I say to do exactly I said to reach as high as you could, and what did you do? Well, you kind of went high. And then I said reach a little bit higher. Did you have more? Yes, you did. Yes, you did. You held back. See, God knows that even when you're giving it all, it's not quite all. James is saying here in verse 8, hang on. Hang on. Give it all you have. Why do we hold on a little longer, reach a little higher, and do it happily? Let's read verse 9 to find out. Hey, do not complain, brethren, against one another, so that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. The strains of persecution might lead to grumbling. Strains of change do the same thing. James is encouraging us to, just like Paul did in Philippians 2.14, resist falling into the sin of grumbling. Why? 2 John 8 says it well. Because then we'll forfeit our full reward of the fellowship with God. He's standing right at the door. Neat picture. But really, like right at the door? He's going to open it at any moment and begin the proceedings of judgment and blessing? Yeah. Remember, a thousand years is like a day to the Lord. And you know what? We're a lot like our kids. Five minutes into the 15-hour trip, 
asking insistently from the back seat, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? When are we going to be there? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And what's our answer? Don't make me come back there. I'll give you something to cry about. Now, typically it's, hey, we'll get there when we get there. Let's enjoy the ride. And let's prepare ourselves for when we get to Wally World, because then we're going to have a great time. And then James goes on and he says, hey, if that's not enough reason for you and you don't have a concrete enough example, let's read verse 10. As an example, brethren, of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Most Old Testament prophets underwent great persecution. Frankly, a lot of pastors who hold to the word, preach the word, and challenge their congregations to the call suffer. And I'm not being self-serving here. I'm talking about guys much greater. Guys that we see in Iraq, Iran. We see them in the Middle East. We see them in China. We see them all over the place. They suffer a great deal. James continues, We count those blessed who endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings. Job, the ultimate example of believing in God the entire time one is suffering. This is the third use of the word patience in this paragraph. It's when he blesses those who persevere. The Greek verb is hypomeno and the noon hypomene, and they describe the more active side of patience. Like a runner who has to persevere to the end of a marathon. Business people who persevere through plans and execution thereof. Pastors have to persevere through change. All meaning James intends on this spectrum are rooted in this one word for patience. Right here he's saying, be patient, but be active in your patience. So Job is persevering. And... You might not, if you've read Job recently, ascribe patience as one of his virtues. He is at times impatient with his three friends and even with God. But in this third version of patience, he endures, he sees it through. And what happens? The last part of verse 11, the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. He remembers the Lord's compassion and mercy. And that's what James is challenging us to do. These words, compassion and mercy, they mean much more than the synonyms for love. They indicate visceral feelings of the deep-seated emotional feeling of love. God's love is more than a dispassionate, detached interest in our well-being. It's an involved, caring relationship. He knows you personally. He loves you personally. See, it's the difference of, well, of course I love those kids playing on that playground. And here's my child standing in front of me who's got a skin knee. That's God. That second one who loves us and sees us as we are. So as we move to the last verse of the paragraph, and it seems that James switches gears on us again. Verse 12. He introduces what seems to be another topic at the last minute. Let's read it. But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but your yes is to be yes and your no, no, so that you may not fall under judgment. This is about speech. It's about speech. What do we know from James, from Jeremiah, from Jesus himself? Speech reveals the condition of the heart. Flippant, profane, or blasphemous oaths are forbidden. We know that. Let your yes be yes, echoes Jesus in Matthew 5.37. We see a call here for plain speech, honesty, and the call of your heart and mouth to be connected without a filter. Seems like a new call from James, right? No, this is not at all a new call from James. He's been challenging us through his whole letter to choose the word or the world, not to live in two worlds. 
This isn't a new call. This verse is a reminder of what he's been telling us all along. Question for you. Question for you. Think about this for a moment. If you're always telling the truth, why would you need an oath at all? If you're always telling the truth, why would you have to swear to it? By heaven and by earth, I'm telling the truth. Well, to tell you the truth, well, honestly, what does that mean? The rest of the time you're not? Let's stop living double lives, being double-minded. That's what James is saying. Let your yes be yes, let your no be no. So, we're back to the original question. Is rich overrated? You mean the people that are unsaved and measure their worth by the things that they have? Yep, it's overrated. It leads the cattle to slaughter. Let me ask the question again. Is rich overrated? You mean the believers who hoard their talent, their ability, God's money? Yeah. It's overrated because they don't have the full blessing of God. They don't have that deep and abiding relationship with them. Author Mitchell Dillon tells this story. He says, this is true, by the way. He says, did you know that every year more Monopoly money is printed than real money? Yep. Every year more Monopoly money is printed than real money. He says, when I first heard this, I found it difficult to believe. Then after I thought about it, I realized that I had a lot more Monopoly money than I did real money. Anybody say amen to that one? Uh Uh-huh. I'm going out to buy another Monopoly game. Unfortunately, monopoly money is of no use in the real world. Not because of the inferior paper on which it's printed or the cheap ink which is used to manufacture it, but because it lacks the backing of the United States Treasury. It's the authority of the government that gives greenbacks their value. If the Treasury Department were to decide to back monopoly money, then things would be different. Until that happens, I'll continue to be richer at play than in real life. Listen, for us, in the same way, when it comes to what's important in life, there's only one authority with the right to determine the value and meaning of things. And that authority belongs to God. Whatever God approves has real value and meaning. Conversely, whatever God opposes is counted as debt to those who live accordingly. We fool ourselves when we presume to have the right to decide what matters in life. I want you to think about how many folks here uh, have have seen A Christmas Carol by by Charles Dickens? Seen that before? Okay, my favorite one is the one with Alistair Sim, the original, right? The, The black and white one, have you seen that one? Yeah, okay, love it, absolutely love it. Remember him on Christmas Day after being visited by the three ghosts? When he throws the window open, he could hardly stand the joy of giving his money to those who needed it. But more importantly, if you watch the end of that movie, he gave himself to those around him. And I'm challenging you to give yourself to the one who made you. How about you? What talent, what time, what ability do you have Could you not sign up to help for the fall festival? Is that not being obedient? Is that not stopping to hoard the richness, the riches of you? Can you give cheerfully and generously? To start out exactly the way Paul did, uh, excuse me, James did, the beginning of chapter 5, come now which translated in the NIV says, now listen. Now listen.